So this will be a dialogue that will continue in our virtual uh, National Evaluation Capacity MEC community of practice after today. Uh, so we can bring inputs to the discussions uh, of the fourth International Conference on National Evaluation Capacities that will take place in Bangkok this, can, this coming October. So Paul Ladd, our Director of UNDP's team on the post-2015 development agenda, will speak for about 20 to 30 minutes and drive us through this road from the MDGs to the SDGs. And after that, we will um, welcome comments from the colleagues uh, in WABEX and also the colleagues present here um, to further frame the discussions in terms of the implications that the SDGs bring to the evaluation community. So before we get started, um, I would like to request all of you joining in WebEx to, um, to please send in your comments in writing as we go along. And we'll try to answer them at the end of the discussions, uh, alternating between WebEx and the colleagues here present. So to start the discussions, our director, Indra Naidu, in the Independent Evaluation Office, uh, would like to say some very brief words, welcoming words to uh, stir the dialogue. Okay. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening everyone. Uh, thank you very much. Um, thank you to Paul and colleagues for joining this very interesting webinar. It comes at a time when we are um, at the edge of in engaging with the SDGs and the conference in Bangkok is an ideal opportunity to deepen discussion on this. Now, as we approach the General Assembly, uh, where in a few weeks member states will make a decision about the SDGs, it's also an opportune moment for us as evaluators and the development community to reflect on what have been the lessons learned from the MDGs and we are very happy to note that the IEO has just completed a comprehensive assessment of the Millennium Development Goals which uh, bridges the discussion uh, from the past to the future and to think of what are the implications but more specifically what are the implications and opportunities that this broader ambit of SDGs brings to the development community and the evaluation community who obviously are going to be very engaged because what is not contested and what is clear is that at the level of the, the SDGs there would have to be high levels of national evaluation capacity uh, built and developed to help governments to on their own as part of their own process of managing development and self-determination uh, engage with results for their own development agenda. Um, and we hope that this discussion uh, will take us closer to understanding the context in which we must identify priorities for national evaluation capacity to support the SDGs. It's part of a series of our road towards the Bangkok event, the largest event by government participation in the world. Uh, we're very happy to note great progress. We also are very pleased that we are this year in doing it in partnership, uh, uh, not only with, with, with partners in UNDP Asia, but also with the International Development Evaluation Association, which then takes it to a further uh, high level. Uh, once again, thank you, Paul, uh, for being with us. We value your expertise. Uh, we are very privileged to have your insights, and we look forward to hearing from you as you help us think through conceptually this very important piece of work. Over to you, Anna. Thank you. Thank you very much, Andrew. Thank you very much, Anna. Um, hello everybody, I know you're in uh, different time zones around the world, uh, so thank you for joining um, us today. Uh, my name's Paul Ladd. Um, for the last four years in UNDP, I've been uh, leading a team which has supported not just uh, UNDP as, a, as an agency, but also the UN system uh, in their work to help member states come up with a, a development agenda that would succeed the Millennium Declaration and the, and the MDGs. So I've uh, lived and breathed more or less every single aspect of this agenda, the politics, the content, the process, the disruptions, the discontent, and then finally what we hope will be the success uh, in September uh, next month. Um, I'm going to try to do um, four things. Uh, the first is to, it's just a recap on, on the MDGs, what they were, uh, what we believe uh, they achieved in different places and what some of their failures or gaps were. And then secondly, to consider uh, the characteristics of the SDGs. How are they different uh, from the MDGs? What do they bring 
to this new development agenda. Thirdly, uh, just to touch briefly on why the SDGs have actually turned out to be what they are uh, and the linkages between the process that the global community has followed this time to derive the SDGs in contrast to that for the MDGs but also some of the other challenges that came into play during that period. And then lastly, a sort of capture what happens next. What happens next in terms of deriving indicators, in terms of building capacity for data, for evaluation. And then also a little plug for uh, how the UN system uh, intends to coordinate its own support for member states and other partners uh, over the next 15 years. So, so first of all, on, on the MDGs, I'm sure that many of you, many of you will be aware of the MDGs will have worked with them in different settings, um, including the national setting over the last uh, 14 and a half years. But they were a set of, of eight goals, uh, eventually 21 um, targets, I think 48 indicators, that captured predominantly aspects of what we would call social development. Now the, the MDGs, the reason that they covered largely social development is quite interesting. In many ways it was a counter uh, reaction to almost two decades of a focus on economic development. And in particularly the 1980s where there was a dominant paradigm about moving towards more market structured economies, freeing up economic actors, uh, uh, reducing government uh, involvement and engagement and promoting growth and jobs and therefore eliminating poverty through that route. Through, I think, rather groundbreaking work, first by UNICEF at the end of the 1980s and then in UNDP's uh, Human Development Report Office, the paradigm slowly shifted to thinking about how people should and could be at the centre of development and all the other non-economic aspects of uh, what it meant to grow your opportunities and capacities to experience life in a, in a fulfilling way. So by the time we got to the end of the 1990s, the debate around what development is and therefore what should be measured or captured in goals was very vibrant. We still had goal one in the MDGs that looked at uh, income poverty, but the other MDGs were about access to services in particular, education, um, health, uh, reducing the impacts of communicable diseases, uh, gender equality. There was a, uh, a somewhat limited uh, goal seven on, uh, envir on the environment, and then goal eight was around uh, a small subsection of, of partnership issues related to aid, to trade, and to access to um, technologies. Now, it's very difficult to assess the contribution that the MDGs made in, in the absence of considering the counterfactual, as, as I'm sure many of you will be aware. Um, I think the consensus is that, at the very least, the MDGs gave us the world a common project working in the direction of reducing the most extreme facets of poverty, whether they were income poverty or lack of access to services and opportunities. There is some evidence at the sector level, particularly in health, that the existence of the MDGs uh, generated partnerships and spurred more political will and more financial resources to tackle some problems, in particular um, the ones on communicable diseases. What's more difficult to assess is whether that came at the cost of allocations of political will and resources to other topics. But we do know that at least for the first uh, eight years of the, uh, of the century, uh, we had development assistance growing uh, and therefore there was a larger envelope to allocate to the challenges set out in the MDGs. There is evidence that in some countries, particularly those countries where governments and other national stakeholders uh, in time owned the MDGs and therefore internalised them into national policy planning processes, that progress was faster in later periods of the MDG era compared to the pre-MDG area. And that's in particular in countries which may actually not meet the goals, and therefore we say achieve the MDGs, but have certainly made um, a lot of progress towards them. And in some ways it's unfair that they're judged to have not met the uh, MDGs. Because one of the most important characteristics of the MDGs when they were first derived is that they were global in nature. They were global goals. 
they were not meant to be applied at the country level. And later, somewhat deliberately, the international community changed that narrative so that they were applied um, at the national level. And of course, applying the same set of targets and goals to countries across very, very vast, different development contexts was always going to be a problematic thing um, to do. So just in summary, before, before I run out of time, um, certainly some successes at the political level in having a common project, some successes in certain sectors in certain countries, but then also some significant questions about whether the MDGs made any difference, for example, on income poverty, where the bulk of uh, the progress was made uh, in countries like China and India and other emerging economies, and that would have probably happened anyway. So the MDGs probably had less of an impact on, on some of the MDGs. Um, so turning now to how, how are the SDGs um, different? And they're different in a, in a considerable number of ways. First of all, there's the, the scope. Where the MDGs predominantly covered social development, the SDGs take their cue not only from the Millennium Declaration, but also uh, the heritage of Rio. So they base themselves in the framework of sustainable development and cover um, dimensions of sustainability related to social development and poverty, because after all, it's impossible to have a sustainable world with 1.2 billion people living in poverty. But also, they pay um, considerable attention to aspects of economic sustainability, to environmental sustainability, and, and this is somewhat of a, of a breakthrough, uh, for issues related to governance, personal security, and institutions, and what the role that they play in, in underpinning sustainability and all the other um, dimensions. So the scope of the goals is much, much broader um, than, the, uh, than the MDGs. And that probably led to governments proposing that there be 17 SDGs, in contrast to the eight of the, of the MDGs. The number of targets proposed under those 17 goals is also significantly expanded uh, from the MDG era, where there are now 169 um, targets. The risk is, of course, is that there will be a huge and unwieldy and unmanageable number of indicators too. But I want to reserve that indicator discussion for the end of the presentation, where we can talk about uh, the pros and cons of that, because it's still um, evolving. So anyway, the first point is the SDG agenda set out by governments is, is, is much broader and covers many more issues than the MDGs um, did. Um, it's also more ambitious, and not just because it covers more areas, it's more ambitious even in the structure of the goals and targets in contrast to the MDGs. So for the MDGs we had a target of reducing uh, income poverty defined by uh, initially $1 a day and then $1.25 in purchasing power parity terms, um, reducing that by half over the lifetime of the MDGs. The SDGs set our target to eliminate income poverty. And just to go into that in a little bit more depth, that isn't a simple linear extrapolation where, for example, if you put in $500 billion to reduce half of the world's poverty, it'll only cost you a billion to do the second half. It's going to get more difficult because you have dispersed communities, dispersed populations who face uh, compounding disadvantages. So you have this problem of what we would call the last mile, where it gets exponentially more difficult to reach the end of a target than it does to reduce it by, by half. Um, the level of ambition on education, um, on health, uh, and indeed all of the other goals that are specified outside of those MDG parameters is much more ambitious than the MDGs. And in some ways, much more aligned with the human rights aspirations that governments have agreed to over the last uh, 70 years in various, various instruments. But suffice to say that the ambition is significantly increased. Um, the agenda is intended to be integrated. Now, it's not that uh, development practitioners, people living in poverty, people facing disadvantages or people who work in multilateral organisations to attempt to help countries and people living in poverty. It's not that people don't understand that development is complex and integrated. It's just that when we get to the business of defining programmes and packages to provide support, as we did for the NDGs, we tend to 
stay in our silos. So if we have an HIV and AIDS response program, we tend to think of it as a, of an HIV and AIDS response program. We don't link it to transport infrastructure. We don't link it as, as much as we should do to education, to other aspects of the natural environment. Uh, and those were some of the critiques of the MDGs, that you know there were gaps in terms of their formulation, but also we didn't think of it as an agenda where we were fully considering the linkages between different goals. Um, the SDGs are intended to be different. Whether we achieve that or not is another thing. Um, but you'll notice in the targets specified under each of the 17 goals, they read across to other subject areas. So in the goal on education, um, there's a target on education for sustainable um, development. Um, and there are lots of examples that I can, can, can give. There are several clearly strongly cross-cutting areas like gender, but uh, if you look at it in the whole, the agenda is much more uh, integrated. Um, another difference is that it's, it's less tightly specified, and this has clear implications for how you measure it down the road and how you evaluate progress. The targets and the indicators, for the most part, if I leave out MDG8 at least, were reasonably well specified with clear metrics and actually clear data sources that sat behind them. For the SDGs, some of them are well specified, some of them have clear data sources that sit behind them. Some of them will require innovations in, in data and innovations in indicator construction. And others, yet, yeah, are specified so loosely that it will be very, very difficult to measure. There are aspirations around policy space at the national level, which we understand and know is an important consideration of autonomy in defining a nationally appropriate development strategy, but at the same time, how do you measure policy space? That's one of the questions that comes out of, uh, of, of the SDGs. And then lastly, um, and this is potentially the most transformative aspect of the agenda, is that it's intended to be universal in nature, covering all countries and all people. Now, for a few months, there's been a discussion about how people interpret universality. Is a universal agenda still about poverty and about rich countries helping poor countries with challenges around poverty, or is it about issues related to environmental degradation, emissions, trade, migration, including in rich countries, that impact on development in rich countries? So slightly, a slightly more modest construction where we could call all countries developing in many aspects and a recognition that, for example, the UK is, I think, 38th in the global table of uh, gender equality in political representation, but that many other countries uh, have significant health coverage problems, even though they're considered OECD countries, that increasingly in uh, countries that we've considered developing or poor, we're going to have problems that we've more traditionally associated with rich countries, like obesity, other NCDs, uh, tobacco use, alcohol abuse. So a much more messy, complicated, but I think also uh, a welcome and modest approach to what development is. So it's not just rich countries transferring aid to help poor countries tackle malnutrition and poverty. Um, it's also going to be make it very difficult to measure, if you like, the, the causal link between what makes progress and what doesn't. Because we're not just thinking about development in a national space anymore. We're thinking about the linkages between countries. Uh, so uh, the obvious one, of course, is emissions. How do emissions in different parts of the world impact on the space available to develop in a safe manner in other parts of the world? What do we do about migration and the, its impact on development? Something that has actually made progress in the new agenda, but it isn't as well captured as it possibly could be in terms of one of the major challenges that we're going to be facing over the next uh, 50 years. Um, so that's a, a little bit of a flavour of how the SDGs are different, more ambitious, more complex, universal in nature, possibly less well specified and an aspiration for, the, for them to be integrated. I just want to spend a little bit of time on, on how they turned out to be like that. Um, partly it was a, an understanding of the much more complex set of global challenges that the world is facing. So the NDGs for the first seven years of their life had a relatively easy run, a common project that people were getting behind, 
they were increasingly integrated into national strategies. ODA was rising. There were discussions around policy coherence, at least in the areas of trade and debt. And then in 2007, 2008, you had the onset of the global economic and financial crisis. You had vast rewinding of MDG progress in, in countries that were susceptible to the impacts of the financial crisis. You had price shocks on food and fuel. You had an increasing number of environmental um, disasters. You had governance shocks in the, in the Arab states where there were popular revolutions to overthrow what people saw as unrepresentative um, administrations. So you had a series of shocks reflecting a volatility that uh, we hadn't really appreciated when we set the MDGs. Um, we had a greater acceptance at the political level of the scientific evidence behind climate change, which we didn't have in the year 1999-2000, but increasingly uh, we do have. So the, the process around the MDGs has included a much more in-depth and longer discussion about the, the reality of the challenges that the world is facing, I think in a very, very good way. Uh, one of my colleagues calls the process over the last two years that governments have engaged in as the, the best training in sustainable development that diplomats have, have ever had. And they've been talking for two years about these things, really in, in, in some depth. Um, the second thing is really the consultation process that has grown up around uh, the derivation of the SDGs. Now, partly that was to bring people's perspectives from all over the world to make sure that the agenda was informed by what people thought was important. But politically also, it's played a very important role in keeping governments honest in the negotiations. Because usually at the tail end of a political process, things get compromised and governments wind back from maybe the level of ambition that they need to rise to to meet these challenges. And what the vast engagement of civil society, of academia, of the scientific community has meant is that when that has happened, there's been pushback. And governments have generally stayed on track. If you look at the 17 goals and the 169 targets, although it's easy to critique them for their size, they're generally quite ambitious. They cover the sorts of things that need to be, uh, that need to be addressed. So those two things taken together have, think, have kept us on the track uh, of this relatively uh, ambitious uh, framework that will be agreed next month. So lastly, let me just turn to um, what happens next. Um, we are still more or less at the beginning of a process to consider indicators for the SDG framework. Um, in contrast to the MDGs, uh, governments have decided that they want to take this upon themselves to do, bringing in their national statisticians with a strong understanding of what's possible and what's not possible in terms of the agenda that's been um, set out. Of course, when you take it out of the technical space, it does introduce different sets of challenges. The negotiations around indicators become political, and we know that indicators are political because they highlight particular context-specific challenges in some countries, whether it's exclusion of certain groups or lack of progress in one particular area that an incumbent government may not wish to uh, bring attention to. So there's, a, there's an issue that's going to require careful management until March next year, which is when the indicator framework is set to be um, agreed. But what governments have agreed, and this is quite interesting, I think, again, from uh, an evaluation perspective, is that there will be a more limited set of global indicators for which every country should make best efforts to track progress on. So we have a degree of comparability and we can generally check the trajectory of global progress. But because the agenda is universal, because it covers countries in very, very different situations, there will be a significant onus on countries to develop national indicators, nationally specific indicators, that are in line with whatever they've set out in their development strategies, development plans, and um, budget allocations. So that's going to be an interesting challenge, but I think it's a move in the right direction. We're not applying the same straitjacket or template of global indicators across all development contexts, because we understand that that doesn't make um, as much sense. But related to that, there is an absolute mountain to climb in terms of data systems and data availability, an absolute mountain. 
I mean, for the MDGs, we had many countries that had one data point on arguably some of the easier to measure MDGs, like income poverty, where there was only one household survey in, in the 15 year period. For an agenda like the SDGs, with 17 goals and the complexity of the topics it covers, there will have to be significant investments in traditional administrative data, censuses and household surveys to even come close to start measuring progress on the agenda. I think the international community and countries themselves are only just becoming, beginning to get to grips with the scale of the challenge they face. Now there are new opportunities though, um, lent by technology use, what we can proxy from people's use of technology, from people's uh, exhaust streams that they leave in their use of social media products. There is a little bit that we can do on that, um, but it won't cover all the gaps. And at best, because it won't be statistically representative in many sample sets, they will simply act as proxies between more formal data and sources. There are also opportunities in more limited uh, surveys around uh, behaviour and perceptions, more qualitative data. So it's not as if that we're only going to be relying on censuses and household surveys. There are new opportunities for new measurement techniques and tools, but it's still going to take a lot of political attention and money to actually bring those things through to um, fruition. And then lastly, I just wanted to end it with a plug for um, how the UN system intends to orient itself to support governments and national stakeholders on implementation. Um, at the beginning of this year, in the UN Development Group, um, we agreed a common approach to providing support. And it has three components under the acronym uh, MAPS. Um, the M uh, stands for the rather bland term of mainstreaming, but it suits the acronym very well. Um, but basically, mainstreaming is about working with governments and national stakeholders, if they require support, to consider what's being done already, because it's not that these are tablets coming down from on high. Governments are already doing a lot across the 17 areas of the SDGs, but considering what's being done, what the existing trajectories of progress are, and what additionally would be need to be done to set a course to meet the SDGs in each country. That eventually, over what I expect to be two, three, four years, will lead to an integration of the SDG objectives into national planning instruments, uh, including at the subnational level, and then eventually budget allocations and policy, and policy statements. Um, secondly, um, for the last um, five years of the MDG period, the UN system has been using um, a very, very simple analytical approach, which we call the MDG acceleration framework, the MAF. Uh, which was basically a, a way of getting people together uh, in a multi-stakeholder way to find out what the most pressing constraints to faster progress in a particular MDG were. Um, that tool in and of itself is probably not sophisticated enough to be applied to the SDGs because of the complexity of the agenda and the interlinkages. So we need to evolve a new set of analytical tools that can help governments work out where to place their limited resources. So for example, are there core bottlenecks that if unlocked would accelerate progress across a suite of MDGs at the same time? So by investing in the empowerment of women and girls, do we unlock progress in six SDGs or seven SDGs? By investing in transport infrastructure, what progress do we unlock across the suite of SDGs? So there's a lot of work underway at the minute on modelling, on forecasting, on looking at the linkages between different goals and targets. So we're evolving to a much more sort of analytically rich space for considering how to help governments. And that's the, the acceleration part of the UN's um, common strategy. And the PS of MAPS um, simply stands for policy support. Um, in, in my own agency, UNDP, um, the bulk of our programmatic spend and experience is in the area of governance, um, peace building, uh, conflict recovery, early recovery, and then we have significant programs on biodiversity and climate change adaptation as well. But the idea is that each bit of the UN system needs to work harder 
to provide the expertise in the areas where they have expertise to governments when, when asked for it. And indeed, we need to get to the point where we can work across agencies to provide multidisciplinary and multi-agency support to countries in different situations. That will mean also bringing in uh, the non-resident specialised agencies that aren't often present at the country level and finding a way to subsidise their engagement in providing their policy, expertise and advice um, to governments. So let me stop there. I don't know how long that was. We're at least 20 minutes. In we are very good. Thank you so much, Paul. Has capacity development been considered in this process? You know, um, not many countries will be ready to collect data, analyze data, and use it in the most effective way. Has capacity development been for data collection process and analysis been considered uh, in the discussions? Well, uh, uh, rhetorically, yes. It comes up in pretty much every statement that uh, every member of the G77 makes in terms of implementation of the new agenda. And explicitly, a capacity is recognised in Goal 17, including that relating to data capacity. But then it's quite a different thing to say, is that happening properly? What does it really mean? As a, as a very modest contribution, uh, we have a small project in UNDP, which is going to be uh, working in about eight or ten countries across different country typologies to assess what we've been calling data ecosystems. So you have, you know, capacity in national statistical functions. Sometimes those are independent, sometimes those are not. Sometimes they are well resourced, financially and with staff, and other times they are not. Um, you have a frequency of data collection instruments that are either resourced or not. But you also have capacities for generating data in the private sector, in civil society. You have a regulatory environment which often specifies whether data is open or not, or transparent or accessible by people. So taken together, all of these things in our, in our mind create a data e ecosystem which allows you or not to track progress against the SDGs. So just as our very first modest contribution, what we want to do is, is inform member states and others what the state of these ecosystems are across different territories to give an indication of the challenge, basically. You know, in certain countries it will require legislative and regulatory reform to improve the data ecosystem. In other countries it will require tapping into the data available in the private sector that's usually held on a proprietary basis, but is used to measure you know, the economic context for business, maybe inflation rates, other things. Um, the, the data that exists in civil society, which can also get sometimes be a bit more local level and grassroots than that available through uh, you know, higher level surveys. But anyway, that's the general point. But there's not yet a proper discussion on the extent of the challenge on strengthening capacity for data. Thank you. Let's see if we can get Shiv back. Oh, uh, he was just on, but he, his, his connection got lost again. Ah, uh, you just and, lost I'm messaging. Okay. Yeah, he's, he's using his phone, so... Uh -huh. Okay, well, so maybe we can go around the table and, and then I'll come some questions from the, the art web. Uh, and just say it doesn't have to be questions, because I Comments, really don't know right? the answer to a lot of these things. So <laughs> right. I think it can be statements and comments. Yeah. So thank you very much, Paul, uh, for very clearly uh, uh, presenting what has been done as well as a roadmap. But I think uh, what is very important is showing the difference between the MDGs and the SDGs. Uh, clearly what emerges from your presentation and in terms of the years ahead is that it's a much more complex uh, agenda to engage with from an evaluation perspective. I think just your numbers in the increase in indicators and the data that needs to feed the, those indicators is, is a challenge on its own. Uh, but what is also uh, quite striking and what makes this a lot more significant is given the high level of uh, negotiation and engagement in, the, uh, in coming to the political process for the SDGs, there should be a greater amount of buy-in. Um, and that in itself, I think, would help as far as development goes. But if anyone were to think that uh, just having a set of, of uh, SDGs which uses words like eliminate is going to bring about changes. It still remains at the level of rhetoric until it's followed up with funding and huge amounts of investment in that. Uh, but I think it's clearly put in. Your discussion here helps us a lot for the next conference. 
in the formulation of questions which will actually uh, help, I think, at two levels. One, the pre-conference training sessions, which need to reflect on these no matter what they are. But secondly, the actual substantive discussions that take place in the week. Um, I know Adol's been thinking a lot around this subject, and if I hand over to Adol to make some points. So. Okay, thank you, uh, in, 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 just well, one or two points and, and one question to, to, to Paul. Uh, um, to me, it seems that complementing the historical uh, perspective that uh, Paul uh, raised, uh, the moment in time when the MDGs arose uh, was also one in which the understanding of public administration and uh, public functions uh, was at a particular juncture. We, uh, it was an era when, uh, uh, in this country, the United States, uh, but also influencing many other countries, one had a great emphasis on the, the, uh, the business of, of, of uh, uh, results measurement. Uh, there was a Government Performance Results Act, and there was results based management, was sort of what filled the room of, of, of discussions about organizational reforms. And it was also a moment in time when, in a, in a certain sense, it seems to me there, there was a kind of a grand bargain between the, 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 the donors and the recipients of development assistance uh, uh, and, and, and it sort of infused uh, a, 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 a sense of enthusiasm to the purpose of, of, of development assistance. And, and now I'm jumping ahead to the SDGs, it, it seems to me that, that, that they, and now we're talking about a different kind of paradigm which one that puts much greater uh, emphasis onto the national arena and the national ownership and the universality. And, and we don't have the same sort of causal proposition, if you wish, uh, and, and uh, by way of the role of what we as development agencies and what the donors uh, can do about the SDGs. My question to Paul then, where do you see ODA go from here in, in reference to the SDGs? Um, I think there's, a, there's been a, a fascinating discussion most recently for the Financing for Development Conference that took place in Alice on, on, on financing develop, for development and the role of domestic resources and the role of ODA and the role of finance generally. And um, thinking about it a little bit, I've, I've got a slightly sort of different take about the, the overall framing of the question. And the first thing to say is I think that this this new agenda, in contrast, the MDGs, crudely put, were a compact between maybe the rich north and the poorer south for a transfer of additional resources to supplement domestic resources, to focus on the things that together they cared about, but also the rich world cared about, whether it was their domestic constituencies or whatever. The SDGs are policy rich. If you look through them, not everything requires big bucks. A lot of it is about the much harder job of policy reform, where within the context of a political economy, you have winners and you have losers. So it's about fiscal reform, it's about how you allocate existing flows of money. It's about how you regulate private spending, whether it's me as an individual or community spending or business spending. It's about aligning investments and consumption so that they're consistent with the goals and targets set out in the SDGs. So it's not all about gap filling, which was the MDG sort of <coughs> characterised. I've been trying to make the argument that you shouldn't really, but it's a bit of a, a false exercise to, to say, well, we suddenly we need trillions of dollars, and a lot of it will come from the private sector, and we need to increase aid. Clearly, aid is still going to be important for poorer countries, and we need to deal with the private sector. But it's a, it's a much more richer discussion about aligning, aligning resources. I, I still see aid... As, as very important for, for certain types of countries, but we, we seem to be stuck in this very difficult transition phase between aid for poverty, and we've had a growing discussion on aid for environment, aid for climate, and the need to bring those together in a way which doesn't upset the political forces that sort of sit behind what the objectives of aid are. Um, because you can easily see in our, uh, a situation where aid remains more or less the same level, but it's intended now to cover many, many more different things, and that wouldn't be appropriate. And I think if we recognise that aid can play a role in climate change adaptation, as well as investments in reducing the most extreme facets of poverty, then aid still needs to increase. Aid will still need to increase to a level where it's meeting those requirements in the SDGs. Um, 
the comment on uh, focusing on results is really quite interesting. I was in the UK government between 1997 and 2005, and it was an era when the UK government was obsessed with setting targets on things as well, often with unintended consequences in different sectors. So health waiting times, how would you get them down? Well, you could do that by managing you know, who you brought into the waiting room uh, for certain groups of people and then not bringing people or not setting appointments for other groups of um, people. So you have to be very careful about this whole setting target um, process. But if done well, then generally it can act as an additional tool in a policymaker's kit to bring you know, attention and resources to a, to a particular issue. But it's certainly no, no guarantee that progress will be made. It's just an additional way of trying to spur progress. By any chance, do we have shift back? No. No? Okay. All right, we have a couple of questions from the colleagues online. One is if whether, from Trinidad Tobago, can you tell us what are the eight countries involved in the UNDP data assessment project? And then we have another one that is, um, you know, how can the evaluation community prepare to support and to evaluate the SDGs? I, and maybe I shouldn't take the second, because I don't know. <laughs> And on the first one, it's very easy because actually we're deciding those countries at the moment. And we are looking at the Latin American Caribbean region uh, for our colleague from Trinidad and Tobago. Um, and we're looking, I think, to have Colombia as one country um, and then possibly one in the sort of uh, mainstream Caribbean as well. We haven't decided that country yet. Any more comments or questions from your side? How does the evaluation community get ready? Yes, yes, that is an interesting side, you know, and not just the evaluation community, but perhaps also um, UNEP, you know, the, evalu the, the, the UN system and the evaluation community within the UN system. How do we prepare and uh, how are we thinking? And, and that is the key question we're bringing to this conference in, in Bangkok. Of course, it's always been a concern, how do we build capacity, how do we develop capacity, strengthen governments to conduct, manage, commission, uh, use evaluations, um, but now, how do we do this in the context of the SDGs? Uh, it's no longer just complicated to find data and, and digest it, but now, find data in the context of the SDGs um, it is a bit different. Um, I don't know if we would have any comments from the table. Yeah, for, from my perspective is, and coming from one of the country offices, one of the things that I you said in comparison, and comparing the SDGs with the MDGs is that, that the SDGs are uh, fully integrated to the political life on, in the countries with the with the government. One of the things that we have seen in the evaluation, since we are not just as evaluating one spot and just one moment in time, but mostly a cycle, a programmatic cycle. One of my questions is, how are we, as UNDP, going to orchestrate the work of UNCT, including those specialized agencies in the country, to go further, just one cycle? Because since it is very political, the thing about the SDGs, what are the governments going to want to put attention or the light on? How can we sort of accompany that in order to keep um, a more um, sustainable progress in the SDGs. I'm coming from Chile. Chile is one of the countries that the MDGs was really uh, something very integrated into the political life. Mm. So we got some progress, but because was the, the thing were, went far beyond the presidency or the, the political uh, president in the power. So how can we orchestrate the UNCT or how do you see that? The, um Many of, I think of about 88 of the UN system's program countries, so 88 UNCTs, played a very, very active role in hosting consultative activities with reaching out directly to citizens, but also organized civil society and others. So in some ways, for the last two to three years, they've been in this space already. And in fact, the, the positive feedback I get, there, there were bad consultation processes as well. But the ones that did it really well, the strong UNCTs with good RCs, actually created space for themselves. They created a stronger engagement with government and an, an increasing sort of level of trust that they could be the leader you know, on implementation. Um, before the end of September, 
um, in within the UN Development Group, we prepared. It's about forty or fifty pages long. It's reasonably thorough, but it's a guide for staff CTs about how they could engage with governments and other stakeholders to support a dialogue on national level implementation. And it talks about horizontal integration across government departments and ministries. So not just going to the ones that you traditionally know, your networks that you work with, but that if you're going to have a discussion around health, you bring in the environment agency and others. And of course, you can't dictate this from New York. It takes sensible, sensitive staff at country level to interpret and use that guidance in a way that you know, helps help them make progress. It talks about vertical integration, so how you go from national planning processes and structures down to sub-national and local. It gives guidance and tips on how to communicate the agenda, how to engage and stretch spaces so that you bring in civil society. So I think from a lot of countries, this sort of guidance will, will get them running at least, will we'll provide some sort of um, um, materials. Um, what was I going to say? This is very, this is very one important thing that doesn't get talked about very much, and this is the the, the natural uh, expectation that countries will prioritise within that agenda. If you take your typical country, they'll say 17 goals, we're not going to do it all at once. We think in our development setting, A, B and C are the most important. And that, I think, is a un completely understandable thing to do. But I think sort of what sits also behind your question is how the UN system can defend the integrity of the agenda, the fact that uh, much of the normative and rights-based content is at risk of dropping out in some countries because it won't be prioritised within that setting. And I think one of the messages that we've been trying to communicate is, while on the one hand it's completely understandable that you're going to look across this agenda, and if you're landlocked, you're not going to spend much time on the ocean's goal, right? But do know that all best efforts will be made over the next 15 years to see what progress you've made across the whole piece. So if you are in the UK 38th in the table for gender representation in parliaments, then you know you expect to see some investments there to improve that over the 15 years. And even if you're not if you're not doing it, then you could expect that you're going to be in a league table somewhere in 15 yes. years' time, and people are going to know how much progress you've made. So that's the same across all countries. You know. Chile or somewhere else may not prioritise issue X, but the expectation is that the information will be in the public domain to see what they've done on that issue. Okay. We have a very interesting question on the chat uh, from, I can't quite get from who is coming, but uh, I was slightly alarmed to hear at a recent discussion the suggestion that countries could pick and choose SDGs, choose which they will prioritise. This surely gives leeway for business as usual and incentive, uh, incentives to pick the easy wins and avoid the harder transformational ones. And it loses uh, the whole integrated nature and potential. How do we message that prioritization is not necessarily about picking the easy options? Well, it, it's very much related to this yeah. discussion just now. It's going to require careful management because, as I say, it's completely understandable that a government will say, well, given our development context, given our level of capacities, institutions and assets in these areas, these things are going to be more important. It's going to be a sensitive engagement from the UN system and development partners and national stakeholders, local CSOs, local business, to say, well, actually, what you've left out is a very key part of this, which is, say, a change in energy policy. And the reason you've left it out is because it has difficult distributional implications. Mm -hmm. But then it's up to the national political setting. You know, it, development actors can't just go in and demand, mm -hmm. demand these things. That's not our role. But we can try to create or encourage a national dialogue in which there's a fair representation of issues that are of importance. And then lastly, as I said, the message is, look, if, if in a political setting you choose not to focus on issue B, that's within your you know, prerogative to do that. But know that in the process of evaluating progress on the SDGs in 15 years' time, you are going to appear in league tables and reports and charts and data that says how, how well you've done on that issue. And if the evaluation is it's because you omitted a consideration of energy policy in your development strategy, you have failed across other areas, then that will come out. Okay. Well, we have just a few more minutes. 
Um, I can't quite see the questions from here. So, but perhaps I can pose one more question that has been coming to us quite often in the community of practice uh, preparing for the conference, which is evaluation. The word evaluation is not exactly in the text of what's produced so far. We see follow-up, we see review, but we don't quite see monitoring and evaluation. And I guess it's part of what you're just explaining. You know, the countries might not necessarily be willing and able to monitor every single indicator or target in the, in, in the 17 goals, but perhaps they will pick and choose and eventually focus on evaluation of their efforts and not necessarily a, a broad monitoring of all uh, efforts from, for the all 17 goals. But why is it exactly, Paul, can you tell us a little bit about the discussions around the words evaluation and review and follow-up and why, what is it that they are expecting, what are the fears behind and how is it that we can prepare to adjust to that sensitive environment and, and, and adjust our language even for the conference. It's a, it's a conference for governments, they are coming um, and we need to be prepared to also know the right language to address them in terms of evaluation given this context for the discussions on the SDGs. Yeah. How people receive all the words in this space that range at the more anodyne end from follow-up, review, to the other extreme, accountability, evaluation. The, the simple dividing line is, is it people doing that to us? Or is it us leading it ourselves? That's what it falls down to. So very few incumbent governments want to create a dynamic where other people are coming in to evaluate them in their political territory. Um, and that's been throughout the history of, of the UN. That, that's what characterizes all discussions on policy space, all discussions on trade, you know, all discussions on emissions and climate. Um, so. For the, specifically for the use of the word evaluation, I think the narrative to encourage is that um, it's not just about you know, having the data to track progress, which is just a very sort of fact-based, table-creating thing. Evaluation is for national stakeholders and governments to work out what's working or not. Yeah. It's a nationally owned process to say, if I do policy A or policy B, what is gonna do better for my country? And for the government themselves, what will do better at keeping me in power as the incumbent government, i.e. what will give more, lend more people to vote for me next time. So I think just the sensitivity is around positioning it as a nationally-led, nationally-owned process that is of value to the country themselves and working out what works best. And I think if you frame it in that way, and not as an external imposition, not as a cost, not as a tax on the existing capacities or resources within a country, then you'll have framed it in the right way. Okay, I think we're coming to the end of the time. I don't know if there are any last comments you would like to make. Would you like to wrap up? No? Well, I don't know if we have anything from, unfortunately we couldn't have um, Shiv join us. I think we covered that question um, already. So Paul, do you have any last words of advice as we move closer to the time of the conference? And of course we hope to leave the conference with some priorities identified in terms of how to move forward with building capacity for evaluation uh, in this new era of the SDGs. Any final advice before we wrap up? No, no, simply to say good luck. I think, um, <laughs> no, I mean, the, the, the very sort of mother and apple pie thing to say is, and what we've realized in the UN system at the program level, is that no one development act and no one agency can do this themselves. We, it's absolutely incumbent on the multilateral system and other development partners to work together in a proper way this time. And that wasn't entirely evident in the MDGs. And I, I'm imagining for evaluation processes and for evaluation networks, the same will be the same. It will be the same. Every single evaluation asset across the UN system and in line with what, what existing governments needs to be sort of mobilized not under one big blueprint, but at least have a common understanding of the direction of travel for the whole evaluation community over the lifetime of the SDGs, so that you've got bits contributing. And when someone does an evaluation on uh, policy A in 10 countries, you can put that on the map and say, well, we have that there, 
So we've filled out a bit of our matrix, and I think cooperation becomes the absolute button. I myself, I'm going to be leaving UNDP at the end of September and going back into the research community. So hopefully I can play my little bit from that bit of the UN as well. So we may get to work together again. That's wonderful. Thank, Thank you very much. Very Thank much. Good Thank luck. You. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. We will be posting the, the recorded session also online and social media and continue this discussion on the community of practice. Thank you. Thank you, Paul.